Yeah, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, Tuesday masterclass sessions, which is uh, what Yesoda Hospital, in association with ISCM Hyderabad chapter, we are doing since more than one year now. And uh, today, like this, is helping the students. Let it be IDCM or the DNB students immensely. So, few people will be presenting. But today's uh, topic we have. Two seasoned speakers and moderators, uh, Dr. Praveen Amin, he is head of the department of critical care at Bombay Hospital. He also goes to Beach Candy Hospital as a consultant of critical care. He is a past ICCM, uh, ICCM uh, our uh, president of ICCM. He had mul multiple publications, more than 120 publications in national, international, and he has wrote uh, 16 chapters in multiple books. He has done many things and uh, welcome, sir. He is one of the senior most uh, critical care physicians what we have in our uh, country right now. Welcome uh, for this Tuesday program, sir. Our second Thank moderator you. for today is uh, Dr. Hemant. He is a senior critical care consultant at Kangri Hospital at uh, Bangalore. So today what we are going to discuss uh, is a very, very important topic when it comes to any student. Uh, that is sepsis, sepsis shock and... Uh, uh, sorry, just a small correction. Kenger is the area I've given you. Oh. It's a, I work for uh, Glen Eagles Global Hospital. I'm the sorry, uh, Kenger is a sorry, sorry, sorry. Is a, okay. Uh, very sorry, sir. So basically, okay. what we are going to discuss today is uh, sepsis, shock, and uh, maybe hemodynamic monitoring. How to go about it? Maybe in detail. To take us through, we have two of our students, Dr. Satish and uh, Dr. Uh, Chinmay, both are IDCCM residents. So, so without wasting much time, let us start our case presentation and uh, Dr. Praveen Amin and Dr. Hemant to take over from here. And students, I request you to post your questions in Q&A. If there is anything relevant that need to be discussed, can be discussed in between when our moderator believe that uh, that need to be discussed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Take Dr. Satish and uh, Chinmay, we can start off your presentation. Okay. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Chinmay. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Satish. Yeah. Dr. Satish, please reshare the PPT. Good uh, uh, Dr. Satish, you have to close the PPT completely and you have to reopen it. Slide show is disabled. to open it again. Is it visible, sir? Yeah. A 60 years male who is an ex-banker by profession, a resident of Hyderabad, presented with complaints of vomitings, 8 to 10 episodes for two days, loose stools, 2 to 3 episodes for two days, and pain in abdomen and abdominal distension for one day. Mm, patient was coming to the issue of presenting illness. Uh, patient was apparently already two days back. To start with, patient developed complaints of vomitings, 8 to 10 episodes, which is bilious, containing food particles and non-projectile. And loose stools, two to three episodes, which is watery, non foul smelling, associated with one episode of black color stools. It is followed by abdominal pain, which is diffused, dull, non radiating, increasing intensity associated with abdominal distensions. Just hold on, go back to the previous slide. Just whatever information you have given in this slide, yes. can you just tell us what is your inference from this slide that you have put? What is that you're trying to rule in and what are the things you're trying to rule out? Um, actually, a uh, patient presented with uh, vomitings and uh, loose tools, sir. Uh, and vomitings, which is non-projectile, uh, that's why uh, 
due to uh, basically uh, patient presented with short history of vomiting blue stool and he also had one episode of uh, black colored stool so uh, so first uh, with the uh, symptoms like vomiting and uh, the, uh, loose stool so it can be acute uh, gas acute gastroenteritis uh, uh, then uh, he also had one episode of black colored stool so any upper GI bleeding also uh, the uh, the probability is there but after these uh, after these uh, these symptoms next day he developed abdominal pain also and abdominal distension so there can be uh, it can be associated with any acute pancreatitis or any uh, uh, acute uh, or any intestinal, intestinal obstruction also because it usually will start with vomiting and then followed with the distension. So initially these uh, did, uh, these DDs were in the mind. Sir. Can we just skip the full history first and then stop after the history so that then we can find out where the lacunae in the history is? Yeah, perfect. We just finish the full history and then we'll yeah. stop there and then we will talk about what uh, what what are lacunae in the history? Okay. With these complaints, patient was admitted and evaluated in a outside hospital and treated it as uh, gastroenteritis for one day. In outside hospital, he received uh, IV fluids uh, at the rate of 70 uh, 75 ml per hour and injection monas of one gram IV BD and injection metrozil 500 mg IV TID and injection pant of 40 mg IV body. Patient developed abdominal distension there and, and was unable to pass stool and flatus. And patient was shifted to our hospital for further management. Um, there is no history of chest pain, palpitations or dyspnea. And there is no history of hematemesis. And there is no history of uh, drug abuse or any addition. And there is no history of trauma or any surgery. And patient is a known case of diabetics and was on a tablet glycomet 500 mg um, BD. And uh, he is a known hypertensive for which he is taking uh, uh, Telma 40 mg OD. And there is no um, past or family history which is, which is not significant. Okay. So, uh, would you like to tell us uh, a little bit more? One is you said there was vomiting. You said not projectile. Mm -hmm. Now, you said there was food particle and there was bilious particle, right? Now, was this associated with colicky pain or not? And was the colicky pain relieved after vomiting? And what was the quantum of vomiting? Was there a large quantum of uh, this thing? You know, when you have a large amount of uh, vomitus coming out, it gives you a history in that uh, context. Second... Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that uh, was that you said there was no hematemesis, all that you have covered well. Now, you said there was a lot of abdominal distension. Now, abdominal distension is a subjective thing. Was, was the abdominal distension so much that it had respiratory distress? Because somewhere along, I find that no respiratory distress was found. And uh, did, did the abdominal distend? And he has not passed platus. So you had absolute constipation, things like that. So one, and then you got a differential diagnosis before when Dr. Hemant asked you, you said differential diagnosis of pancreatitis. You have not mentioned anything about uh, uh, alcohol consumption uh, in, this, in the history. So that's a very, if you're thinking of pancreatitis, you should have asked for a history of alcohol consumption. Uh, and, you know, social history of smoking. Now, you said he's a diabetic, he's hypertensive. So, what is the association between vomiting and diabetes? I mean, he was on small doses of medicine. So, uh, I, I presume that he was, since he was an intelligent banker, he would have probably followed up well in terms of this thing. And then, generally, when you talk to patients, you should say... Uh, Intelligent people, you should say, what was his last HbA1c? Most of your most of your intelligent people will tell you that that this was what the HbA1c was, and whether he was adequately controlled or not. Yes. You follow, Doctor? Yes. You want to ask anything more? Uh, add anything more? Smoking history, another thing that is not mentioned. Yeah, there was no any addiction history, sir. No any drug abuse or no any history of any addiction, sir. Okay. Uh, right. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, food part like uh, uh, no addictions. All right, fair addiction. enough. But you know, addiction doesn't mean that a person doesn't have a social drink. Addiction mm -hmm. means you're you're talking about alcohol consumption as an uh, addiction. But 
somebody takes social drinking can still get pancreatitis yes sir. so uh, there was no history of any smoking or any addiction thing. drug abuse and addiction it means a chronic consumption mm -hmm. uh, but if there were episodes of uh, you know the short forms kind of uh, tell you that uh, you know people can be still having a social drink and is not considered to be an addict yes yeah uh, doctor any yeah. other uh, quest queries regarding the uh, history? That's fine. Only thing is, uh, you know, you said food particles. Okay. Yes. That necessarily that, that uh, you know, gives you any clue that you're trying to convey something when you say food particles and bilious. That's the that's only thing which I wanted to. So usually with bili uh, bilious and uh, bilious vomiting or any food particles, uh, it, it could uh, suggest towards the obstructions okay. or inter uh, intestinal obstruction. And uh, uh, the quantity was not very much uh, large, sir. Uh, just only few food no, parts, like a, a small quantity was there, sir. Uh, uh, and uh, it uh, the pain was intermittent and it still was persistent. And uh, it not uh, entirely rare uh, after vomiting, sir. Okay. The other question is, uh, uh, when you said uh, there was a lot of vomiting, uh, uh, there was no colicky pain. Did you go back and find out about the colicky pain? Uh, sir, patient yes. was just giving any uh, just history of a diffuse pain only, sir. No, not just any radiating pain or any colicky pain, sir. Just diffuse and, pain he was complaining, sir. And in your history, was there any investigations available from the past uh, hospital when he came in? Uh, sir, uh, only a CBC count were uh, uh, available, sir. Other uh, and uh, uh, and you, uh, ultra, ultra out, outside USG abdomen was out, uh, available, sir. So okay, they didn't do a plain X-ray abdomen in the other no, hospital. No, sir. No, sir. And uh, when he came, when he came to your hospital, he obviously was a little. Uh, how was how was his mentation and all that uh, in the previous hospital? Was he fully alert, conscious, and things like that? Initially, he was sir alert, sir alert, conscious, and following. But uh, uh, after uh, the second or third day, uh, when he started developing abdominal distension, uh, the sensorium little bit uh, uh, deteriorated. It was he become drowsy and irritable, but he was easy, easily arousable, and uh, he developed some uh, breathlessness, uh, like mild tachypnea was there. Uh, so that's why the patient got shifted to a hospital. Sir. And how many how many days was he in that other hospital? One day, sir. sir one, one day. Uh, two days, one actually. Day. One day symptoms were there. Two days he was admitted and then shifted to our hospital. Sir. All right. Okay. Proceed ahead. Uh, coming to the examination, um, on arrival, patient is looking toxic and drowsy and irritable, uh, irritable and following comments. He is tachypnic and maintaining his uh, airways. Sir. There is no signs of paler, ictress, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy and edema. And uh, cap capillary refilling time is uh, 5 seconds. Coming to his vitals, uh, his BP is uh, 80 by 50 mmHg and pulse rate is 140 per minute, which is regular. And coming to SPO2, 86% uh, with uh, room air and 95% uh, with uh, 5 liters of uh, oxygen on face mask. Coming to the respiratory rate, he is, um, his respiratory rate was uh, 34 per minute and temperature is 1.8 1 1 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Just a, just a feedback, doctor. Whenever you talk, no, you should go by airway breathing circulation. So the order in which you are described, okay, uh, you know, may not be appropriate for critical care setting. Whenever you describe, it is appropriate, you know, you to go in airway breathing circulation and then go for cystic examination. Okay, yeah, please proceed. And you said there's a temperature. Did they complain of temperature in the past or in the previous hospital? No, sir. Initially, temperature was not there, sir. After okay. admission, he had one small spike, like 100 degree Fahrenheit, uh, one spike was there. But uh, during present, uh, earlier, uh, fever was not there. It was during last admission, like during admission. Before so admission, it is he, not he didn't. Uh, he developed fever in your hospital, not in the previous hospital. Uh, previous hospital, during admission, he had one spike of fever, sir. But uh, present, it not started with fever, sir. Okay. All right. What's your inference with that? All right, go on. Um, on a systemic examination, on um, uh, perabdominal examination, the positive findings are on inspection. Uh, abdomen is distended and coming to the uh, palpation, uh, there is diffuse tenderness uh, with a gardening and the rigidity is present, sir. Coming to the percussion, uh, on percussion, uh, tym tympanic note and there is no fluid thrill or uh, any horseshoe shaped dullness. Coming to the auscult auscultation, the bowl sensor hurts, sir. 
come into this uh, cardiovascular system examination with S1 and S2 uh, heard and there is no murmur and JVP is not raised. Coming to the respiratory system examination, bilateral air entry present with normal vesicular breath sounds heard and there is um, no added sounds. Coming to the CNS, patient is drowsy and erosible and irritable and following commands. With the above history and examination, um, our uh, differentials is uh, going towards um, sepsis and acute gastroenteritis, acute pancreatitis, uh, mesenteric ischemia, and intestinal obstruction and intestinal perfusion and peritonitis. Okay, uh, we can stop here. Uh, could you tell me, was there any rebound tenderness? Uh, the, on the left lumbar region, there was a rebound tenderness was there, sir. Okay. And uh, you said there's no horseshoe, uh, this thing. Yes. Sir. Uh, so you're obviously saying that there was no shifting dullness. Shifting all dullness, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. yes. No sir. shifting dullness. You had no shifting dullness. Yes. And uh, so you were quite certain. And uh, at that point, uh, uh, what was your steps that, uh, what was the thought process? You said you've got these gastroenteritis, pancreatitis, and mesenteric ischemia. Why did you think of each of this? Could you just elaborate and why why was the each of these factors to, uh, thought about? Sir, in, the reason for the differential diagnosis. Actually, uh, sepsis, sir, uh, in general examination, actually, um, on uh, in CNS examination, patient is drowsy, sir. Uh, So, so patient was drowsy uh, and uh, he had hypotension, uh, tachycardia and uh, also uh, uh, respiratory rate was high and temperature was there. So uh, it, uh, it, uh, it it was indicating toward, uh, toward sepsis and he had uh, complaints of, uh, started complaints with vomiting and loose motions and also had fever after that. So that's why uh, uh, differential of acute gastroenteritis was uh, uh, put, sir. And uh, for pancreatitis, sir, he had uh, uh, like same uh, uh, multiple... Okay, one minute. You said the CRT was five seconds. How was the peripheries? Was it so, so cold? They are not audible. Um, uh, you know, peripheries were warm or freeze. Was it cold? Warm, yes, sir, warm peripheries or cold peripheries? Warm, warm sir. sir. Warm, sir. So, so. What type of the important thing is looking at the peripheries is an important step in terms of the, sep the shock that you are in. Yes. Okay, so looking at the peripheries, uh, whether it is a warm periphery or cold periphery, tells you about different things in terms of even resuscitation when you go yes. about it. So there is an important tool in terms of trying to get that information. Yes, yeah. so usually cold calabi peripheries will be in the hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock uh, uh, because of. Uh, and uh, usually warm peripheries with where there is hyperdynamic Septic. circulation is there. So usually in septic shock, it will be or distributive shock. It will be warm in, in the initial part. In, in septic, and septic shock, you can have different stages because yes. he's come from a different hospital. So if he is, if he is warm, probably sir, it may give you more information that this fellow is more sicker, right? Yes, sir. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay. Go on. So you have uh, you have elaborated on all of this. Why did you think of mesenteric ischemia? Sir, pain was pain. very much extensive. Uh, like initially, also in last uh, last hospital, also he was uh, vitals were stable, but pain was very excessive as compared to his uh, hemodynamics and uh, hemodynamic condition. So that's why we think of uh, any uh, uh, mesenteric ischemia. Also, we had one episode of uh, uh, black not... colored stool, so that ischemia can also uh, lead can lead to bleed. Uh, would, you, would you get uh, a black color stool, or would you get fresh blood in uh, in an ischemic uh, bowel? Sir, uh, if it is huge, uh, like upper GI, upper GI tract is involved, then, uh, then maybe we'll be, black we can get a black colored stool. Okay, but uh, uh, would you? Can you get fresh blood also in ischemic bowel? Uh, yes, sir. We can. 
can you get fresh blood also in ischemic but it depends on the site of the, site. this thing upper gi generally because of the acid it tends to give you a black color lower gi maybe even even the inferior mesenteric or even some part of the superior mesenteric you can still get uh, fresh blood in it mm -hmm. so that's one uh, but you said there's no fluid no peritonized do you think uh, in this in a gangrenous ischemic bowel uh, would you get uh, uh, would you get a peritonite peritoneal fluid or no sir uh, there may be chance of uh, development of secondary bacterial in, uh, peritonitis sir in that we can uh... so in 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 that question to you about mesenteric ischemia when you have you are right in thinking in terms of mesenteric ischemia severe abdominal pain uh, followed by i have you know signs of intestinal obstruction with some blood in the stool you are right in thinking about it but when gangrene sets in what is the phases of an ischemic uh, uh, gut the first phase is that you get severe abdominal pain then afterwards you get a silent abdomen you know the pain goes off and that's when when the pain goes off so your pain was a continuing or it was going it went off when it came to you did the intensity of pain come down or did it uh, was it same as it was before in the previous admission or was it increasing it was increasing, increasing sir it was increasing yes, okay. so when the uh, when the pain becomes less in an ischemic bowel you then itis and that's one of the important steps that you need to know is when you do an ultrasound then put in a needle the classical diagnosis would be you get a hemorrhagic uh, hemorrhagic fluid when you put in a needle that is suggestive that this is gangrenous and is probably also had some leakages into the peritoneal system so uh, looking for fluid is an important part of ischemic bowel okay so mm -hmm. that's uh, why did you think in terms of intestinal perforation you said intestinal i assume that it is uh, viscous some kind of bowel perforation mm -hmm. sir uh, there was a rigidity there is no fluid you said there is no fluid no, in the no. abdomen would you would you expect a perforated uh, no, sir with perforation uh, there should be fluid admin, but uh, on uh, examination there was a rigidity and okay. uh, guarding tenderness so uh, those Now, what happens to the liver dullness when you have a perforation liver dullness would you have the obliteration of the liver dullness if you perforate uh, yeah. there's a lot of gas under the diaphragm uh, Uh, yes, sir. There, there can be a, uh, with the with the extensive gas, there can be hyperresonant uh, note can also be there. Or if there is excessive fluid, then throughout we can get a dull note also, sir. So, okay. all right. So peritonitis without fluid is a. Yes. So I guess you put it lies down because of that, yes, or uh, yes, sir. Yeah, because only that uh, systemic examination showed signs, so that's why we put it in the last, sir. Okay. Go on. And uh, Dr. Ahmed. yeah you know uh, you said patient was drowsy at admission isn't it yes yes yeah what are the differentials for drowsiness in this situation um actually patient had fever no sir uh, we should have uh, suspect um, in in terms of uh, meningitis also sir but there is no neck stiffness on examination Sir, patient mm -hmm. is a uh, uh, patient is hypotensive also, so uh, that uh, and uh, uh, other parameters are suggesting uh, towards sepsis. Also. So sepsis can also uh, it can manifest as a like CNS involvement with a uh, drowsiness or any irritability. It can present sir or up to coma also. You haven't told us what the counts. You haven't told us what the counts was in that previous hospital. Sir, counts are uh, counts are mildly raised. Sir, uh, it was a twelve twelve thousand seven hundred. Sir, outside. it okay. was done on day 1 of admission sir and day on day 3 patient was shifted uh, day 2 counts are not repeated okay cerebral hypoperfusion okay septic encephalopathy okay anything else because you have gone through the entire uh, you know you have you are you have probably more information about the patient than rest 
of the participants now. So, you know, with all the information, you know, because I've gone through that. So what are the other one or two things you would like to keep in mind apart from cerebral hypoperfusion and septic encephalopathy at this stage? Okay, any person coming with acute gastroenteritis, severe dehydration comes with drowsiness to you. Okay, what is a life-threatening complication that you would like to keep in your mind? Sir, uh, uh, hypoglycemia or any electrolyte, dis uh, dis uh, any electrolyte disturbances can uh, lead to seizure or any neuro... Uh... Okay, severe dehydration. Okay, what so are the... Yes. Thromboembolism can be with the severe dehydration. It can be. Yeah, please always remember somebody coming with very severe dehydration is drowsy. Keep that in mind because that's often something that is missed in the clinical examination. Okay, which you end up picking up very late. Okay, because you tend to your focus shifts away from, uh, you know, mainly towards fluid resuscitation, other things. You know, you you entirely think that drowsiness could be because of heart multiple other things. Okay, you end up missing this important thing, which is potentially addressable. Okay, yeah, please continue. Could you also think that there could have been a stroke if you're thinking of ischemia in this patient? Uh, so there were no any neurological symptoms. Uh, there is no uh, focal neurological defect. And there is no FND, sir. There is no focal neurological defect. So, uh, and there is no syncoparny loss of consciousness or any uh, uh, other seizure. So the neuro stroke is less likely. Would you, would you have asked for some drug history? Would they have given some morphine-like drugs in, in the previous hospital? Did you ask for drug history? Yes, sir. Um, that would be the poss possibility that one needs to keep in mind that, uh, you know, it's quite common when somebody has uh, this thing, some kind of uh, uh, morphine or even, you know, a narcotic agent would have been given for the pain. And uh, that may have uh, be responsible for the drowsiness. That's a possibility. Yes. Yeah. So, was there any drug history that you were able to elicit? Uh, no, sir. They didn't give any history. On the, the, on the discharge card also, it was not mentioned. About only, any... He received only antibiotics and uh, IV fluids, sir. Then he got shifted here. Because as the pain is worsening and uh, patient becoming brown, they shifted here. Sir. Right. Proceed ahead. Proceed. Uh, in here, um, IV fluid NS, uh, one liter ball is uh, given followed by 150 ml per hour. And uh, in, uh, they started a uh, um, infusion, uh, 0.25 uh, mix k per kg per minute. And they have in, inserted uh, um, RT uh, resistive uh, insertion and uh, they started on uh, NIV support, sir. And blood cultures and urine cultures were sent and started on uh, injection uh, uh, meropenum 1 gram IV and injection targosid 400 mg IV given and pant up. Uh, 800 mg uh, ball is given uh, followed by 8 mg uh, per hour infusion started and he is shifted to AMC. Sir. Okay. Uh, do you kind of agree with what they did? So they started with uh, IV fluids uh, uh, and uh, since patient had already received outside IV fluids, so the bolus amount they have given, uh, the is, it is less but that can be because of uh, the patient already had received outside IV fluids. So Why do you say it's less? Uh, sir, uh, if, uh, as, as if we are, uh, uh, since we are thinking about sepsis, so sir, the initial fluid should be 30 ml per okay. kg, uh, bolus should be given, sir, within three hours. So, uh, with going the, by the surviving sepsis guidelines, is it 30 ml per kg? A lot of people are disputing that, uh, though it is recommended in the guidelines, uh, would you go give fluids as a calculated dose? In an elderly person, uh, you have come, you don't have any uh, status of what is cardiac status. You don't have anything of that kind. Uh, would you? We should, we should, uh, we should, we should assess look at the fluid some, uh, look at and some parameters before giving it, giving a fluid. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the actual uh, the, uh, there was hypotension and there was uh, uh, there was no uh, any bivasal crepts were there, so no uh, any no signs of any pulmonary edema, uh, and the JVP was collapsing, sir. Uh, so even if he had crepts, would you think that uh, fluid should not be have been given to him? 
because somebody who's got severe abdominal distension won't that cause some degree of atelectasis uh, mm -hmm. yes. the lower that itself can give rise to crib so i mean clinical examination is good enough but i think you need some more information in terms of how much fluid and what quantity of fluids to give and then yes. when to start the vasopressor so yes. so bedside usg so can be done an, he's come from another hospital who possibly uh, may not have been geared to understand the severity that's why they shifted to your hospital right yes, you're a tertiary referral center so so bedside UAG to... can be done, sir. Uh, B profiling, we have to see uh, whether is there any, any IVC collapsibility, we can see any B profiling or any plural effusions, we can see any cardiac contracty also, we can see, sir. So with the, all this, we can give uh, fluid. And information, after putting the rice tube, how much fluid came out? How much was, how much was the aspiration? Uh, sir, aspiration was around only 100 to 150 ml. Uh, actually, patient was, uh, they have kept NBM in the last, uh, for last two days. Two days. But uh, overall aspiration, uh, hardly about 100 ml came, sir. Yeah, but he's had 10 episodes of vomiting. And uh, they had yeah. put a rise tube, which I think itself uh, was a concern, when, especially when he's given a history of absolute constipation. So I think, do you think what they did was right there? Probably not. They should have put in a rise tube at that point. When there was a history of absolute constipation, he said no flatus passed, no stool passed. Yes, so, sir. what was the quantity? You got only 100 ml. So, it's telling you that uh, maybe he vomited a lot before coming. Did yes. he vomit before coming into the in your hospital? So, the vomitings were persistent, sir. Uh, like, uh, there is no so, recent episode, but vomiting so he was, was decompressing himself. He was decompressing himself, right? Yes. By vomiting, right? Okay. It's a couple of things here. You know, your decision to give one liter IV bolus was considering hypovolemia or considering septic shock. There are two different aspects here. Okay. And that's exactly what Dr. Pravid Namin was trying to get from uh, from your side. So, yes, sir, one, um, uh, so septic shock. Uh, we are thinking about septic shock, sir. That's why we gave initial bolus mean to say in septic shock first you know what is the current understanding you give fluid wait for the response and then start vasopressors i know sir or... we should start with the fluid and uh, uh, like uh, we should uh, we should start with the fluid but we shouldn't wait for 3 hours or total uh, to wait for if the uh, bp is improving or not we uh, we should start uh, we can start the uh, vasopressors uh, early and then we can taper off if uh, uh, with the fluid response uh... No, no, don't give me choice. You know, I want to know you are a consultant at the bedside in front of the patient. Okay. See, you have committed that assuming some fluids have been given to the patient in another hospital and you have committed now that one liter bolus you want to give considering septic shock as a scenario, not hypovolemic shock. Okay. Now, in that context, I want to ask you, okay, considering the recent evidence, you would like to first give IV fluid and then wait for the response and then give some more fluids and then take a decision on starting vasopressors or would you like to start them together? That's my question. Sir, uh, we can start together, sir. If uh, is there any contraindication for uh, excessive fluids uh, for patient or if there is any life-threatening uh, hypotension, we can give, uh, we can start along with fluids. Sir. We can start vasopressors along with fluids. Uh, see, uh, in the interest of all the exam going students, I will tell you, please, in the examination, don't say you can do this, you can do that. You're not giving choice here. See, in examination, an examiner is there to check whether you are able to take decisions at the bedside. So always prefer to use the words like, phrases like, I will do this. Don't say you can do that, you can do this. Okay, that shows indecisiveness on your part. Okay, try to say, I will do this. Because that is where, you know, uh, you know, it shows that, you know, what you wish to do rather than, you know, giving us a choice as to whether you can do that or you can do this. Okay, so... So we will start uh, with vasopressor simultaneously, sir, in this case. Okay, what's your uh, goal when you start give IV fluid and then start noradrenaline in this patient? Sir, mean arterial pressure should be more than 65 ml of Fg. That was the initial goal. More than 65 millimeters mercury means how much? 85, 90. Six, so 65, 65 to 70, 70. Uh, 
now remember this, this fellow is a hypertensive yes sir Uh, sir with the patients with hypertension yeah. uh, we can uh, target higher uh, after initial resuscitation we can uh, target uh, we, uh, we 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 would tar- target higher map of around 70 to 80 uh, but initial res- for the resuscitation the map map should be uh, 65 to 70 okay. okay now one more thing uh, you said ivc collapsing please remember when somebody is breathing at 34 respiratory rate okay ivc is bound to collapse yes please don't use that as a dis- you know uh, no, you know use that to decide whether to give fluids especially when somebody is breathing at 34 okay so yeah please proceed and uh, you're talking of ng insertion we stopped at that isn't it and then yeah. now coming to niv support isn't why it why was the need for the niv support is it just mandatory that you know you got somebody with an acute abdomen you don't know what his abdominal status is you don't have any uh, you know is a diabetic so diabetics have you know gastric dilatation i mean was it a good idea to put niv support when your saturations came up with regular oxygen and he was drowsy also and he was drowsy uh, you've got a clear cut formula somebody who is got an obstruction who is drowsy we don't know whether he's got the stomach dilatation you put a niv you have a clear cut shot for aspiration pneumonia uh, sir we should avoid uh, uh, niv with uh, intestinal obstruction or acute abdomen and since patient is drowsy but uh, there were a delay with the uh, relatives because the consent for intubation and all that issue and patient was very much tachypneic uh, when he presented sir and uh, hypoxia was also there uh, he was maintaining on saturation saturation on face mask but tachypnea was very much sir uh, so that's why we first inserted rt and uh, then we started uh, and i will support till we get the time uh, for uh, intubation to be ready and uh, consent and all part to be done tachypneic or was it dyspneic there are two different things uh dyspneic sir make up your mind because you you know these two you know often we tend to use these terms <clears throat> you know replace one by the other okay please remember what, what this exact three muscles in use yes, yes sir. sir okay now was he tachypneic because of the distension or was he was there air hunger you said the respiratory rate was 34 yes to me on with the 89 saturation when he came in after giving 5 liters of oxygen went up to 95 so i mean so probably it is due to abdominal distension somebody who is drowsy somebody is a little drowsy and his saturation You, whatever consent i mean he was there was uh, if a respiratory rate is 34 and a saturation is 95 i would have and he's drowsy i would and he's got probably an intestinal obstruction i would be a little careful about putting an iv support okay because did you check the position of the rt i mean with an x ray because sometimes your tube tends to curl inside you don't aspirate then you put the niv and put you vomits out everything and in the lung it goes with the niv every niv that you give so i would be a little careful about it if your saturation was 95 i'd accept it till i get more information and his respiratory is 34 i would think he's tachypneic of course he's tachypneic we need to address that we don't have a blood gas we don't know if he's hypercapnic or anything of that kind so with that i would still be a little reluctant in a drowsy patient to start uh... yes do you think that the antibiotic which you started was anti- appropriate uh, sir uh, he had received a, a mono, like no, third generation cephalosporin outside sir for two days and uh, like uh, he presented with the acute abdomen uh, with the uh, uh, li- likely there is obstruction or any perf- uh, any obstruction or any ischemia Uh, or any gangrene so we started with the meropenem and uh, to cover the enterococcus uh, since the go-to, the go-to drug is meropenem so you want to use the most strongest thing right up front uh, sir it uh, it will no for example he came he was already started on an antibody he was started on a cephalosporin yes sir. okay all right maybe it's it's okay for respiratory system but intraabdominal would you have started something like piperacillin as a maximum would that have been appropriate at that point of time 
what I'm trying to say is that we are so trigger happy about starting meropenem in all our patients is why we are seeing so much of carbapenem resistance. Yes. So uh, we, I agree that you want to hit it with the strongest antibiotic when they're septic. But I mean, uh, in the intra-abdominal uh, sepsis, something like Pepricillin tazobactam would not have been a bad. I'm not saying that people don't do this. People do this. But this is what we tend to be doing is that we are so trigger happy about starting meropenem uh, that, uh, you know, sim simple Pepricillin tazobactam may have been an appropriate drug. Would you think that would have been appropriate for an intra-abdominal sepsis or no? Uh, an interesting, uh, doctor. What so is covering enterococcus also, I mean, most of the enterococci, I mean, to get enterococci, I, I would cover a gram-positive cover, all right. But, you know, enterococci coming up front, it's usually G gram-negative bacteria. Yes. Okay. But you're right in a way, you, the teaching is that when you have a septic shock, uh, you know, I don't know whether this is a septic shock or sepsis-induced hypertension, which probably patient was not well resuscitated with fluid. But a thought would be, if you give me, I mean, if you say meropenem, I would, I would not disagree with you. But I'm trying to say that we tend to be a little more trigger happy by using uh, the most potent drug first. Of course, now people will say cholestin is more potent. So uh, it won't be long before people say give cholestin as the first drug. Do you think that this fellow would have got uh, nosocomial infection so early? Would you, would you categorize him as having a potential nosocomial infection? Uh, he had uh, admission history for two days, sir, but the symptoms were ongoing and uh, so less yeah, likely. In, uh, you said one day symptom, one day in one hospital. Yes, sir. So, so no, 24 uh, hours in a hospital and he comes to you. Yes. Would you think he, had, he would have colonized or got a secondary infection within 24 no, hours no, of sir. spending time in another hospital? No, the sir. time frame is about 48 hours yes. before you consider for growing bacteria from that hospital. So, just a thought. I mean, if somebody, if you gave me this answer, I won't disagree with you. But as the social obligation, sometimes, you know, we got to think in that manner. Yes. Uh, doctor, what is that Pepricillin tezobactam can kill and meropenem will not kill? Something which you are trying to address? Entrococci, isn't it? Yes, sir. Uh, oh, yes. And, if you, and, if you, and if your choice was to kill entrococci, even with the carbapenem, Imipenem would have killed enterococci, isn't it? Now, the, the, your decision to use uh, targosid, I suppose, is ticoplanin, isn't it? Yes. Sir. Yeah. So you added, and uh, currently, uh, if you look at the evidence for empirical use of, you uh, know, uh, no, antibiotic to kill enterococci, you don't have to cover enterococci. If you look at, you know, the guidelines for use of antibiotics empirically for intra-abdominal infections, and you need not cover enterococci even in uh, immunocompromised patient empirically at the beginning. Yes. So this is something which you have to keep in mind. Yes. Okay. Yeah, please. Okay, one more thing I'd like to tell you as an examiner, I find it terribly irritating when you put uh, brand names in. Uh, you know, it should be mandatory that you should talk, uh, you know, what the a pharmacological name of a drug is. This business of pan infusion, targosid, is, is not a good idea. A lot of examiners get irritated when you start using brand names. So as far as possible, try and use the pharmacological name of the agent that you're using. Yes. Okay? Right. Yeah, please. In uh, investigations, um, uh, his hemoglobin is one uh, fourteen point eight, and the TLC count of uh, nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety, and platelet counts is around uh, two lakhs. Coming to his uh, creatinine, creatinine is uh, uh, one point eight mg per dl, uh, which is quite elevated, and urea is sixty three, 
and uh, lefties and serum electrolytes were uh, within normal range sir and uh, we have sent uh, mls and lipase uh, which is also normal uh, within uh, normal limits and uh, chest x-ray which is um, uh, normal study sir and uh, coming to the viral screening uh, um, hbcg hiv and uh, um, hcv were uh, non reactive sir and uh, we have sent a routine stool examination sir which is awaited sir tbg coming sir ABG was showing uh, metabolic acidosis, sir, with increased lactate. Lactates were, uh, lactates were more than two, uh, more than two, two. and uh, uh, it was showing metabolic acidosis. Sir. Where is the ABG? Show us the ABG. Uh, sir, ABG picture is not there. Right side, we have put uh, mentioned the values, sir. Uh, actually, it was high and gap metabolic acidosis. Uh, okay, all right. PH was 7.18, PCO2 38, uh, PO2 114 uh, with uh, O2 support, uh, NIV support, and uh, uh, bicarb 14.2, uh, and lactates were 3.09. What is your interpretation of the UPG? Sir, we yeah. haven't mentioned here uh, uh, sodium and chloride values, but it was high and gap metabolic acid acidosis, sir, uh, and uh, it was non compensated, sir, because still PCO2 is 38, so respiratory compensation was uh, not there, sir. I think you should avoid using the word uncompensated. It's, you know, you, you, whether it is carbon dioxide is appropriate or not appropriate. If it is high, you're talking about a second component, isn't it? What is the expected carbon dioxide in this patient? Uh, sir, uh, PCO2 would be uh, uh, in the okay. acute cases, uh, 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 like uh, in the in the acidosis, uh, PCO2 should be uh, uh, 1.6, 1.6, uh, 33, uh, 30, uh, 1 and a half times plus 8, 14 plus 7, 21, 8, 29. How much is it? Uh, sir, uh, 38. Yes, is somebody who's breathing at respiratory rate of 34, right? Where the carbon dioxide expected is 28, your carbon dioxide is 38. Mm -hmm. How do you like to review your patient's condition with this blood gas? So there can be a uh, respiratory muscle fatigue uh, can also cause or any, we have to evaluate where there is any underlying uh, uh, lung involvement is there. Uh, but X-ray was showing uh, it was within normal limit. So one, ca one condition, it can be due to... Uh, uh, respiratory muscle fatigue. Uh, the thing is that respiratory muscle fatigue or just the abdominal distension? Uh, yes, sir. Abdominal distension can also cause the decreased tidal volume uh, uh, because the increased abdominal pressure. So, uh, so, so it can due to the decreased tidal volume. Stachypnea can be because of the abdominal distension one, and that may be responsible for this. PCO2 being slightly higher than what it is. And of course, he's a metabolic acidosis. Would that not itself give rise to the tachypnea? Yes, sir. So you said the X-ray is normal. And uh, would you still like to continue him on uh, uh, NIV? Or would you like to correct all his... Sir, we would like to... By now, you once once your fluid, you gave your fluid. What happened to the BP? It's a dynamic process, no? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, with the uh, with norad, sir. One liter of fluid when he came, his BP was eighty and his noradrenaline. Did you? What happened to his heart rate? What happened to his uh, saturations? What happened to his? Uh... Uh, sir, heart rate a little bit came down. It was from one forty. It was uh, around one ten. It was after fluid bolus and starting uh, norad. Uh, Noradrenaline support, uh, but with noradrenaline support, BP was around uh, uh, 100 by 60, sir, initially. So we continued with noradrenaline support. Okay. So you have enough reasons for him to be tachypneic, right? Yes, sir. So we would like to, uh, like, see, since patient is drowsy, tachypneic with abdominal distension, uh, we would go for intubation. Just one more thing. You said increased anion gap metabolic acidosis, isn't it? Yes, sir. Patient uh, is diabetic. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, but sugar, sugar, sugar levels were normal, normal, sir. And urine ketones, like your, your, your urine routine report showed the ketones were negative, sir. 
So uh, should that information should have been captured. Yes, sir. Anybody who's diabetic who's repeatedly vomiting come with an increased anion gap metabolic acidosis. Okay, that's something which you have to keep in mind. Yes, what okay. else will you yeah. keep in Fair. mind when you, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, when the lactate is high? What else will you do? He was on glycomet, right? Yes, yes, yes. Metformin, metformin causes. So, one thing you have to do is to avoid giving more. Uh, yes, sir. We should uh, stop uh, met metformin and uh, if this change. patient is hemodynamically instable, we should start with insulin uh, as per the sugar levels. Yeah, but you said the sugars are normal. Yes, sir. Uh, so, he was on a very small dose of metformin. It's a 500, so, 500, 500 BD, BD, so not much. But you have not mentioned his HPA1C when he came in. HBO uh, reports are not, not available. available. Not available. Did you send it subsequently? What was it? Uh, sir, we have sent it later. It was uh, seven point two. Uh, like uh, after uh, uh, after uh, a patient shifted to AMCU, we have sent it, sir. It was seven point two, sir. On day three, we got the report. Okay, all right. Anything else? Sir, move ahead. Yeah, please. Okay. Mm, ECG showing uh, sinus tachycardia and uh, we have done a 2D echo with um, as assistant fraction of 60% and there is no regional valve motion abnormality. And uh, we have repeated a uh, USG abdomen, sir, uh, which shows uh, grade to fatty liver and uh, dilated um, bowel loop, sir. Uh, it is a um, chest X-ray. Uh, you had already intubated this patient. Uh, so this X-ray is uh, after uh, shifting to uh, AMCU, sir. And uh, in AMCU, we intubated this patient and secured lines, uh, art line and uh, center line. So th this X-ray is actually, sir, after the intubation. Uh, you so can do a plain X-ray abdomen in the sitting position, 45, 50 degrees. Uh, sir, actually, uh, the patient, uh, the UHG was also showing a dilated bowel loops, and yeah. the patient was in uh, uh, was deteriorating. So we directly proceed to CT abdomen. No, patient is deteriorating. You do a chest X-ray, can't you do an X-ray abdomen too? You are sus you're suspecting intestinal. One of your differential diagnoses intestinal obstruction. Yes. And you say your patient is hemodynamically unstable. I mean, would your you would have ultimately done a CT scan. What I'm trying to say is that why wasn't, uh, if you did a chest X-ray, why didn't you do an abdominal X-ray? And if there's an abdominal X-ray in the lying position, uh, what are the options you would do uh, to get more information from the abdominal X-ray? Uh, sir, we can ask patient to <laughs> lie in the lateral position. So I, mean, I can't see the position of the NJ tube also in the X-ray. I mean, since most of it on these slides, you are not able to see. Did you identify the position of the NJ tube where it was? The X-ray doesn't only mean chest, right? Yes. Huh? Would you think you would have got more information out of a out of a X-ray of the abdomen? Uh, yes, sir. If there are multiple air fluid levels uh, or uh, if there is a gas and like if, if the patient is lying down. Yes, the diaphragm, yeah, uh, in a lying position. Sir, we can ask patient to uh, in the, uh, lie in the lateral position so the gas will be collected uh, uh, toward upwards. So in this uh, lateral, uh, like uh, we, we can ass assess about the gas sir, in the abdomen. Go on. Um, we have done CT abdomen. You, you, you put in a urinary catheter, right? Yes, sir. yes, sir. How much was the urine? I don't think you mentioned anything about a catheter. How uh, much did urine? You sir, get a urine sir. after putting the uh, yes, catheter, and what was the output per hour? Uh, 70 to 80. You had a high creatinine, 1.8 creatinine, the yes, blood urea of 63. Sir, initially output around 40 to 50, like uh, 40 to 50 ml per hour, but after resuscitation, uh, it uh, increased to 60 to 70, 70 ml, ml per hour. hour. Okay. Did you consider doing an intra-abdominal pressure monitoring? Should you have done this at this point? You got an acute abdomen? Yes, sir. Would that give given you information? Uh, sir, any compartment syndrome? Uh, uh... So how do you define 
uh, abdominal compartment syndrome and abdominal hypertension? And how do you measure intra-abdominal pressure in, in patients like this? Sir, uh, through uh, urinary catheter, uh, we can... Uh, Vesic, uh, so three uh, three way catheter we can uh, we can connect a trans uh, transducer uh, to the three way uh, uh, urinary catheter and from where do you zero it where do you where do you take the zero level in uh, IAP monitoring where do you zero at what level will you where do you zero it where is the arterial lines growing? You put art. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have put art line. So the art line should be zeroed at the level of uh, uh, um, mid line mid and line. the fourth uh, intercostal space, sir. So, mention mid. I'm going to do IIP monitoring. Where would you zero it? Have you done IIP monitoring? For this patient, we have done. So, have you done uh, as a protocol in your patients with acute abdomen pancreatitis? It's a standard of care now in ICUs, acute abdomen. Especially, you said abdominal distension. How much of the abdominal distension is causing the perfusion, renal perfusion compromise? You know that, no? What is the definition of intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome? How do you classify it? More than 20 mm of uh, HG. Uh, sure. For abdominal compartment syndrome, it is uh, greater than uh, 20 mm. Uh, uh, so what is what is the normal abdominal uh, uh, pressure, intra-abdominal pressure? Uh, less than 5 is Less than five. Not sure. Sir. You're not sure. Less than 12. Yes. Okay. And then you have four grades of abdominal uh, grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four is abdominal compartment syndrome. And how do you say it's abdominal compartment syndrome? More than 20 More than with 20. organ dysfunction. Mm -hmm. This patient has got organ dysfunction. Huh? Mm -hmm. But you have got intraabdominal pressure, so you wouldn't know. Remember, think process is when you have acute abdomen, you have a catheter in position, it's important to get your uh, uh, this thing. So the zero point is at the, uh, the anterior crest of the ileum. That's where you zero it from. Okay. All right. Go on. Uh, what is abdominal perfusion pressure? Uh, sir, dice. Sir, mean arterial pressure minus uh, enter. Uh, You're trying to think in terms of ICP and. Uh, <laughs> Cerebral perfusion pressure. You may not be wrong. I'm not sure, sir. See, that's all. You know, mean arterial pressure minus intraabdominal pressure. 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 We need to understand this. Same, same thing. Same thing. Like the the, the the importance here is that you know we often tend to uh, you know target a mean arterial pressure of sixty five. Okay, that that sounds good in many majority of the patients, but in patients with raised intraabdominal pressure. If you have to save kidneys, especially in patients with chronic hypertension, okay, your your you know you have to consider abdominal perfusion pressure, okay. So you know it should be fifty five and above, okay. Um, I think, sir, we need to address chat box questions also. I think that's okay. you know I'm getting. Uh, we can we just stop for a minute and answer all of those questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. So yes, sir, you can. Would proceed. somebody like to? Read the chat box and anything specific, uh, one of the moderators. Sir. Sure, sir. Yeah, uh, the question, sir, like uh, one minute, sir. Dr. Kaladar here.
Hello, sir. Are you able to hear me, sir? This is Dr. Kaladar here, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm able to hear. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, there are questions actually there from international students. Uh, most of them are from Indonesia and all. So the questions are like, why use normal saline in fluid resuscitation instead of balanced solutions like Ringer acetate and uh, lactate and so on, sir? One question. Yeah. So it's like this. The trick is that uh, one of the problems is that normal saline is not normal. Okay. Uh, the amount of sodium is 154. The chloride content is also high. So when you give a large amount of fluid crystalloid resuscitation, uh, when we talk about large amount, which nowadays is probably gone into the back burner. We don't use that four liters, five liters when you would see hyperchloremia. So in fact, we've just had a recent publication which has come out from uh, France where they've actually looked at balanced solution with saline. There's really not much change because we are not resuscitating that large volume anymore. So you see, when you go up to a liter, liter and a half of saline, it really doesn't make difference. As long as you're monitoring your chlorides, you know, don't let your chlorides jump above 110. So that's important. That's when you could, if your chlorides are moving up, that's when you use balanced solution. And uh, the cheapest of that is, of course, Ringer's lactate. And uh, of course, you don't want to use uh, Ringer's lactate in the presence of, say, if there's associated cerebral injury and things like that, their saline is uh, preferred. So uh, clearly, because we are not using large volumes, uh, the now the current feeling is that a balanced uh, solution should be only used if your chloride levels, when you resuscitate, start moving up because once it goes above 110, then you have the risk of developing, uh, you know, hypochloremic induced uh, metabolic acidosis. So, uh, of course, the uh, if you use uh, Ringer's lactate, it is not uh, that uh, that expensive as opposed <laughs> to sodium acetate, which uh, which seems to uh, tend to be much more ex expensive. So that's the solution. You have anything to add yeah, to that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, there are some other interesting questions from Bunga Ayu. He is from also Indonesia. So he's telling that uh, thank you for the opportunity. And he would like to ask the questions, especially regarding how should we integrate the hemodynamic variables to manage patients with septic shock? So you want how to integrate all the variables. I integrate. Uh, could you specify integrate? Hemodynamic variables. I mean, in, yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, you did not mention much about that uh, variable, sir. But uh, yeah. So the hemodynamics is, you know, is a very judicious use in septic shock. Is a very judicious use of fluids. Uh, you know, not too little, not too much. Too much fluid gives you pulmonary edema. Too little fluid gives rise to renal dysfunction, and. Uh, an appropriate use of vasopressors uh, in acute sepsis. You would like the hemoglobin, uh, you know, pretty clearer, more towards, uh, you know, uh, 10, 11, 12 also in patients who have got ischemic heart disease. So, again, a very judicious use of uh, fluids and vasopressors. And if you've got severe septic shock, maybe shock dose of steroids may be used. Again, you got to look at uh, the integral part of uh, shock is to basically facilitate perfusion pressure. And perfusion pressure is best done with the uh, judicious use, use of fluids and vasopressors. Uh, so, and of course, uh, not to forget that early use within the first, uh, within the first hour of appropriate antibiotic therapy. So, it forms an integral part of management of septic shock. Uh, in terms of variables, uh, you know, various aspects about how you resuscitate, how effective your resuscitation is, is to look at your lactate levels and the lack time. You know, the if you do serial lactate, so I would, uh, I don't know if you all have done the serial lactate to see, but the lactate was not that high. It was three. Uh, but once you get higher lactate, 
then you need to do serial lactate and lack time of you know conventionally a reduction of lactate by 20 percent uh, in the six hour period is is what is desirable uh, you know the faster you get the lactate level the outcomes are better uh, when you get that 20 percent reduction in the lactate level the outcomes are better yes, now my yeah my question to uh, our presenting students is apart from lactate how else will you assess uh, you know uh, perfusion in a patient what yes, other things which you which i i don't know if you have mentioned you have uh, done that here capillary yes, filling times uh... We can we have to see capillary filling time. Capillary filling time is so so user specific. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, would you consider doing an SCV or to you in a central line? Yes, sir. Uh, would you consider looking at an SCV or two? Uh, yes, sir. We can uh, uh, we can say uh, we haven't sent in this case, but we have we can we assess can uh, 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 mixed venous or uh, central venous uh, oxygen the saturation. We can assess sir. Uh, in the uh, in the initial uh, in the initial phase. Uh, 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 when the cardiac output is low, uh, then the uh, the uh, SCVO2 can be uh, can be less, sir. Uh, but uh, uh, when's the uh, the uh, uh, what is your cutoff? What is your cutoff for the SCVO2? Seventy percent. Lactate, you say. What is lactate? What is your cut? What is the value you would be concerned about? SCVO2. What would you be concerned about? So lactate is two millimole per uh, and uh, for SCVO2 seventy percent. Uh, when it falls below a particular, if it falls below 75%, 70, you would be concerned, or will it be below 65? What is the recommended value? 65 or 70? 70. No, most of the studies, what is the average SCVO2 you get in septic shock patients? Uh, Sir, in early stages, it will be low, sir. But in advanced uh, advanced stages, it can uh, it can be higher also when there is no uptake and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm in septic shock, can you get can you get a high SCVO2? Oh, can you get a normal SCVO2 and can you get a low SCVO2? Low SCVO2. Uh -huh. Sir, we can get low SCVO2 also or high SCVO2 also, sir. Uh, in early stages, uh, when uh, with the cardiac output uh, is low, the SCVO2 will be less, sir. Uh, but uh, in late stages, there will be a decreased uh, utilization of oxygen uh, uh, from the tissues. So SCVO2 can be higher also in the late stages also, sir. So it should be correlated with the lactate levels. See, I'm talking about at least there are three to four major trials Okay, where in, so there are arise trial, uh, promise uh, trial, uh, so it, it, it didn't show anything. No, no, let's, let's, not, uh, let's not get into those individual trials. What, what I'm saying is, in general, if you take the gist of all those, what was the average SCVO2 in patients in septic shock in those studies? Because I'm, I'm raising this question again and again because that will help you understand okay, the exact mechanism involved here. So ACPO2 is high here in those patients or ACPO2 is low in those patients in majority of the studies? Majority of the studies, it was high. Okay. So try to understand that. Okay. It is you high. must understand. You know, we always look at the three new studies, the arise, promise, and uh, you know what that is. But what was it compared to baseline? Which was the first trial which looked at it? Was the reverse trial? right? Huh? Early goal directed therapy was the reverse trial. When you look at the first, the new, the other three trials, there are many flaws with that. Most of the patients, when they were recruited for that trial, they were already resuscitated, most of them. But you look at the reverse trial, it is what we would probably fit into our group of patients in our patient. They, it was in a, in a Brooklyn area, in, a, in the Bronx area in New York, where there were large amount of uh, colored population and they would leave the hospital late in septic shock so when they went over there they were you know these people were quite sick and they were SCO2 was very low so when you look at those group of patients and compare it and look at our Indian population I think we should 
in our population, we should look at the reverse study more than the others. We don't need to get into the details about that because then that will take us uh, along. The, the discussion will go in a different direction. But what I'm trying to tell you is that we in our part of the world, we tend to see sepsis a little later because patients come, even they, when they come from other hospitals, like for example, this patient was transferred from another hospital. Obviously, you know, he was still not well resuscitated in that hospital. And, you know, so even patients coming to you, maybe 24 hours, 48 hours later, and was obviously septic when he came to you because he was hypotensive. And you said the creat had gone up. So obviously he was hypoperfusing in every way. So you got to look at it in that context. So uh, an SCVO2 in this group of patients, especially when they come late, will give you directions as to what you should do. Especially when you've got a central line in, in situ, you could consider doing that as an additional tool. Oh. Yeah, any other questions? Uh... Sir, yeah. Uh... There is a question from uh, Nefrizol. So asked about uh, uh, up to what dose do we use norepinephrine? Basically, it's uh, the maximum dose of norepinephrine for septic shock. That is the question, sir. And then there is uh, an interesting question. What is the role of angiotensin 2 and methylene blue? <laughs> Any proven so, role? So, uh, you know, I really cannot tell you the dose uh, we have gone on to pretty high doses with norepinephrine, uh, but when the dose starts to escalate, uh, we usually add a bit of vasopressin in a fixed dose for these group of patients. And when the dose starts escalating, you know, again, uh, there are many factors one needs to look at in terms of dosing. Uh, you know, sometimes we go into an extremely high dose of norepinephrine. Uh, and uh, we would then consider, uh, uh, even consider using septic dose of uh, uh, steroids, in this case, hydrocortisone with fludrocot. You know, if you want to use that combination, if you want to look at the Anan data, uh, you could use that combination. And, uh, you know, again, uh, it's a dynamic process. So I think uh, when somebody needs such high doses, I would then consider using uh, advanced hemodynamic monitoring to look at cardiac contractility. I would, you know, if somebody is needing such a, uh, industrial doses of vasopressors, I would uh, put in a PICO catheter and get more, uh, you know, cardiac output studies because some, most of these patients may have cardio depressed, may have, uh, you know, septic induced myocarditis and so, try to optimize that is an important uh, thing that we should do. Angiotensin 2, I don't think it's properly available anywhere. Uh, you know, uh, though it was done by uh, an Indian, uh, Dr. Ashish, uh, who, who keeps coming to India now, uh, but uh, it's not so freely available anywhere. I don't think even in Europe it's available. And uh, it was available in the US as a, uh, you know, as a, a drug which was a, in experimental phase. I'm not sure it's is freely available angiotensin 2. Methylene blue, you know, this is a is a bit of a, a non-starter, I think, you know, it's because of its antioxidant and supposed to have an effect. People have used it, uh, <laughs> which I think uh, uh, there is no strong data to support the use of methylene blue, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, Hemant, you want to add anything more to that? Yeah, methylene blue, of course, uh, you know, in desperate situations, you know, I have used, I don't know, blood pressures have gone up, whether that's translated into survival, I'm not very sure, uh, methylene blue. Uh, rest, of course, and, and you really need to understand that the response of the endothelium to any vasopressor is not dose dependent. Okay, so what dose we think is high enough Say, for example, noradrenaline and a patient A may not be, cannot be extrapolated to patient B. Try to understand that. So, you know, we, we need to uh, case, take it on a case to case basis. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the interest of the trainees, I would like to tell one thing that when we resuscitate and approach hemodynamically a sick patient, what we are interested in is blood flow to a vital organs. Okay. 
since we are not measuring flow, we are measuring pressure, which is a very poor surrogate of flow. We get some blood pressure reading on the monitor and we think for this blood pressure, which is shown on the monitor, flow is appropriate. So that means we are thinking that the relation between the flow and the pressure is linear, which will not be many times. Okay, this is a very important limitation, which I want you all to take home that we use pressure as a surrogate for flow. Pressure because it's easily measurable. Because if you want to measure flow, it, it requires advanced catalysts. Okay, so we measure pressure. Okay, so try to understand many times, you know, you, you, you get a uh, you know, 120 80 blood pressure with high dose of vasopressors, but if you look at the quality of the tracings, you'll know it, it looks like a tower. Okay, that's that typically a tower sign where pressures will look beautiful on the monitor, but that 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 tower when it comes, that means it the patient will not survive. So this is one limitation which I want you to understand when whenever you're titrating vasopressors. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, there is one more question from Anaslo. He is from also Indonesia, a student of anesthesia from Sebelas University. So, so, so he's basically that, asking that, about role really, of procalcitonin. Really, no, no, it's there. Uh, can I just answer? Can I? Sir. No, can I just you want to improve flow? Uh, sir. Uh, you, you need to use inodilators. That can only be done in the presence of advanced uh, hemodynamics, where you look at cardiac output and uh, integrate that. So you need uh, more integrated tools, either the Volivio catheter or the Pico catheter, whichever is you're familiar with, is a very important tool, which at times uh, uh, may give you benefit. And of course, there will be data which will tell you that there is none of these catheters, neither the pulmonary artery catheter, nor the, uh, the minimally invasive uh, uh, catheter in the outcome. But I think you can't look at outcomes in terms of monitoring tools. You've got to see how you optimize the physiological endpoints. And that's what you need to understand. That when we are treating, when we are treating patients, we do an intervention, we monitor the what impact that intervention has had on the, the thing, whether it's fluid challenge, whether it is, you know, approach, uh, altering your dose of vasopressors. We look at the physiological endpoint that a monitor gives us and then reassess and then reevaluate and then do another intervention and look at the endpoint over there. So every, in, in hemodynamic monitoring, is every intervention that you do decides uh, you need to look at what is the outcome of that uh, intervention in terms of values that you have got from your hemodynamic monitoring. So it's not necessarily all the sophisticated gadget. It's the man behind the uh, decision making who really makes an impact in terms of. So it's the time that you who are actually looking after patients understand what are the physiological changes that take place and try to get an optimum internal menu. That's what you need to uh, probably target. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. If you're successful, you would be able to reverse the shock. If you're not, ultimately that patient is going to succumb. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, and there are questions like basically about uh, fluid responsiveness and uh, whether to, to start uh, to give too many fluid or uh, to start vasopressors simultaneously to maintain the BP, uh, which is better. That answer is all physiological endpoints. So, you look at uh, the amount of fluid, like we said, too much fluid is bad, too little fluid is bad. So, you look at your physiological endpoints. That is, what is the targeted mean arterial pressure, which, you know, no data has said that 65 versus 85 has made a difference in the outcome. Of course, that doesn't hold good for hypertensive patients where the baseline may need to be changed as opposed to a conventional patient. So again, those group of patients need to be targeted different levels. Uh, I really don't have a definite answer to tell you what it is, but I think you got to look at the end point. Did the lactate, which was started at four, five, six, come down uh, to three, four uh, in the first 24 hours? That tells you that you have done the right uh, resuscitation, that you've used the right amount of fluid, maybe the right amount of blood, if maybe packed 
black cells, if need be, right amount of dobutamine to improve peripheral perfusion. So the, it, is, it is a network of things that you're going to do. That is the combination of the antibiotic, the fluid, uh, you know, all, all that renal replacement, if there is acidosis and things like that, all those needs to be integrated. So I, I don't think one size fits all. So you need to understand there are multiple interventions you need to do to your patients to ensure that you are able to, uh, you know, optimize uh, whatever you can optimize. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. And uh, there is one more question like uh, the invasive versus non-invasive cardiac output monitoring devices, uh, which is the best technology, as they were asking. Like, yeah, yes, sir. which is the best technology, especially from the point of non-invasive cardiac output monitoring? Uh, you see, if, uh, what are the best devices? There are multiple uh, things which are now available. Uh, you have the flow track, you have the volley view, you have now little less invasive impedance, uh, impedance plethysmography and things like that. I, I mean, none of them have really uh, made any difference in terms of outcome. Uh, but personally, as a person who's quite uh, familiar with, uh, you know, we've, we used to use a lot of pulmonary artery catheter uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we are hardly using any of that now because uh, the less invasive thermo, uh, thermodilution catheters are prob probably, if used appropriately, may, may help you in terms of uh, uh, you know, optimizing a patient. But uh, it again depends on the severity of the sepsis to tell you whether it works or not. Uh, sometimes, no matter what you do, uh, your patient is... Uh, this thing and uh, of course uh, don't forget in a in a surgical patient always remember source control uh, uh, you know whatever the source that is if there is pus somewhere it needs to be drained and if there is a surgical cause for the uh, for the sepsis you need to go in as early as possible to uh, uh, you know uh, address that surgically so that's a very the important step that you need to understand the type of antibiotic you use, unless you address that uh, component that is uh, the surgical uh, sepsis or whatever that is, pus collection or, uh, or gangrene or whatever that is there, you need to probably go in and uh, address that as ASAP. Okay. Sir, yeah. And uh, mo most of the questions are there, like uh, the role of procalcitonin uh, in the management of sepsis and in prediction. Well, well, truly, it's not more in the diagnosis of sepsis. It would then tell us, I mean, uh, when a procalcitonin is high and it starts to come down, uh, it probably tells you that you're giving appropriate so I would go by serial procalcitonin. It may help me to decide when to stop the antibiotic rather than when to start the antibiotic. Because a sepsis patient is very clear. This patient had a high count, uh, 19,000 count. Uh, you know, a patient was obviously septic fibrite. I mean, the procalcitonin is not going to give me more information to say that he's got an infection. Of course, there are some infections, especially intra-abdominal infection, you might get fungal infections in the intra-abdominal. That will calcitonin. Suppose you have an abdominal leak, and uh, one of the associations of an abdominal leak is fungal infection. And in fungal infections, you may not see. Viral infections, you may not see. So uh, uh, procalcitonin level probably is not used for diagnosis more, but is used more, more for prognosticating and when to decide when to stop antibiotic. I mean, Hemant, do you have any other view, please? Uh... Yeah, I think this, uh, you know, decision to do procalcitonin for every patient perceived to be in sepsis at the time of admission is not a great way because it costs money. I think in, in Bangalore, it's 2,000 rupees and 2,000 rupees means something. So, you know, only if, you know, 3,000, okay. 
So you know, don't use one. See, one of the calcitonin. Sorry. In Bombay, it's three thousand. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, one one pro calcitonin level is like one CVP level. I mean, it it hardly you know helps you in decision making. Can we have the next question? Yeah, or sir. Uh, there is one more question from Santosh. So, can we use PLR with PPV uh, versus stroke volume variation probability? This instead of cardiac output uh, monitor. Yeah, that's uh, okay. you know because we have not yet come to the arterial line tracing, uh, but uh, passive leg uh, is a pretty good way of telling you that patient will respond to fluid resuscitation. So it should be a, a practice which one should do, especially if you've got a, a float track. It gives you the the change in cardiac output is very, very visible on the flow track. Uh, of course, uh, those patients have to be mechanically ventilated. Uh, uh, but passive leg doesn't need mechanical ventilation. So if you have an arterial line, you can elevate the patient up and look at it. And of course, when... <laughs> I don't know what your are you going to show us any arterial tracing or anything like that? I think that will come in the subsequent yeah, discussion. Yes, yeah, sir. I yeah, think... we can have it in the subsequent discussion. Not we will talk about the BP, uh, what the what happens to the arterial line after after you put the arterial line. What happens? Let's have a look at that. Yeah, most of if, the questions have been covered. Sir. We can Thank answer you. the question now. I think we can answer the question at the end now. Yes, sir. Remaining questions we can answer. I think the flow of thought of what is happening the is probably, uh, you know, we are bypassing. We could have answered the question probably after the thing because, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah. So I think what you should consider doing in this particular patient is get a intra, get the habit of doing intra-abdominal monitoring in acute abdomens. It's a good idea. It should be a part. It is. It is like you know. It's like you do arterial line, central line, and things like that. Uh, doing an intra-abdominal pressure monitoring in an acute abdomen is probably something that you should include it as a part of your protocol in patients who come to the ICU with acute abdomen uh, and you know who need for whatever the cause this patient has got. I mean. And it's a good idea, especially when there's distended abdomen. Go on. Proceed with the case. Uh, CT abdomen, uh, suggest of uh, uh, nematosis intestinalis, uh, gas in mesenteric vein and portal vein and intrahepatic portal branches, which is suggest of gangrenous ball. And there is and there is a diffuse uh, dilatation of uh, stomach uh, duodenal jejunal loops with the transition zone in the left lumbar zone. So it's to offer subjective small wall and obstructions. In AMSU, uh, we kept the patient on uh, NBM, sir. Uh, we have placed uh, arterial line and the CVP line. And we... Sorry, what is NBM? Nilbai mall. I, yeah, I, I, I presumed it was non-rebreathing mask. Please avoid using short forms because when I went through, I thought non-rebreathing mask. <laughs> so sorry. It is NBM is nil by mouth, is it? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Some sorry. People yeah. write NPO, some people write NBM. So okay. Yeah, please proceed. We have continued uh, injection meropenum, one gram IV BD, and injection targosid 400 mg IV BD, uh, two doses followed by 200 mg OD. And we have started uh, injection uh, metrogel 500 mg IV TID, and the injection plucanazole 400 mg OD, and the injection panta 400 mg OD. And uh, coming to the IVC uh, assessment, IVC is uh, 0.9 centimeters, and it is more than 50% collapsibility. And we have given IV fluid of one little bottle, sir. And uh, IVF on uh, enter so awareness fluid continue. What happened to the BP? What happened to the BP at this point? You put the arterial line. What is the BP? Uh, sir, when sir. patient shifted uh, to after securing art line, BP was uh, hundred by sixty, like, similar to the uh, in the ER also uh, in the ER, sir. Like after starting vasopressor support, so patient patient was still requiring vasopressor support, and I I diameter was also less than one centimeter, and collapsibility was more than fifty percent. So we gave more fluids sir, to this patient. Okay, now uh, 
would you want to comment on this uh, combination that you have taken a machine gun and shot with every bug that you can think of? Uh, sir, city report was showing uh, gangrenous uh, uh, gangrenous bowel. So we started with metro gel to cover anaerobic uh, for anaerobic cover, better anaerobic oh. cover. So you um, think meropenem doesn't cover all anaerobes? Uh, sir, metro gel have, will be uh, 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 its penetration more and cover will be uh, good for anaerobe as compared to meropenem doesn't cover anaerobes. Uh, it will cover, cover sir, sir, but uh, metro gel Few, uh, few so anaerobes. It covers, so metrogel covers most of the anaerobes that we find in this thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, you know, when you use meropenem, whether you really need to use metronidazole. Again, please use the uh, use the pharmacological name. Don't use uh, this thing. And why flu uh, fluconazole? You have a perforation there. Uh, perforation, uh, uh, perforation, uh, perforation was not there, sir. But gangrenous bowel was there with uh, uh, abdominal obstruction. So, you need and, to uh, start. You need to start looking as also early. Uh, I mean, patient had sir, planned for the surgical. No, no. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, when we tend to indiscriminately use agents which are probably not needed, I mean, you know, even in in the acute pancreatitis where <laughs> It is probably, uh, you know, how late in the uh, this thing there is the indication to use antifungal. You're using antifungal on the first day that he comes to your ICU. What I'm trying to say is that this may not be appropriate. You don't even have a perforation. I mean, you have no evidence of perforation and you have used fluconazole. Mm. I... Uh, I think it was it was not needed because you know the next thing what happens is you started fluconazole he gets one spike and you start him on uh, echinocandins. This is this is knee jerk reaction. Unfortunately, we are you know we have moved one spike of fever and I see this quite often. Let's start echinocandin. So first day. He's come into your ICU, you put in an arterial line, you've given him fluconazole. For what? Uh, so what I'm trying to tell you is that this is not standard of care. And unfortunately, this happens quite a lot of large number of places. Okay, go on. And surgical opinion was taken, sir. And we have repeated ABG, sir, which shows uh, lactates of 2.1, sir, MCU. So were you giving fluids here as maintenance or were you giving fluid here as uh, uh, fluid here as uh, uh, bolus? Sir, yes, sir. We given one more bolus because uh, the IVC, was, the collapsibility was more than 50%. So we give and patient was still requiring uh, vasopressor support. So we gave it one more bolus and we continued with the uh, maintenance fluid, sir. Okay. Now, by this time, patient was on ventilator, isn't it? Uh, yeah, after giving bolus, uh, uh, we intubated okay. later, sir. Uh, we taken we taken surgical opinion also. So patient was uh, planned for uh, emergency operative procedure. So before shifting the patient, we intubated uh, him. What I'm asking is, whatever you have put in the slide now, this information is pre intubation or post -intubation. pre intubation, sir. Patient was continuously breathing, so that's why we did we did the colla uh, collapsibility for uh, like IVC collapsibilities. See, again, so again, you know, somebody is very technic, you know, it, it's very difficult, uh, you know, to comment on IVC is going to, you know, it's going to, the IVC variability will be there when somebody is so technic. So I'm not very sure if there are other. Uh, was, uh, less, uh, sorry? Maximal diameter was also less 0. 0.9 centimeter was maximal diameter. So. But obviously, by this time, the patient is already resuscitated. Your lactate has come down. Your uh, pH is 7.4. 7. 7. Uh, so he was intubated by this time, right? This ABG is pre-intubation or post-intubation? 
pre uh, pre intubation sir like uh, immediately shifting uh, shifted uh, patient shifted to amcu then we repeated abg uh, and uh, other we started antibiotics and fl uh, fluid bolus was given and after that uh, patient was uh, intubated yes. And what yes. was the indication for intubation by that time? Because if this is the pre-intubation APG, what is the indication for intubation? Uh, sir, patient was having a, a abdominal obstruction, so abdominal distension was there and patient was planned for emergency surgery. So before shifting, uh, we intubated the patient. Sir. So both uh, indications were there. So patient what? was still drowsy. No, so you, were, you intubated him for airway protection or you intubated him for... Uh, uh, because the surgeon told you, please intubate and send to the theater. Is that true? Patient was drowsy, tachypneic with abdominal uh, 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 like uh, intestinal obstruction. So that's why we were, we were planning to intubate. But procedure was also planned. So both the reasons were this. Okay. All right. See, because if you look at your gases, it yeah. seems to have all settled down. Your lactate has also come down. And one more thing, whenever you put an ABG, please always mention how much oxygen you're giving. This 164 PO2 is on what? Room air, 2 liters of... Uh, sir, 40% FI. Uh, no, no, he was on NIV, no? When this yes, was sir. On. yes, sir. You are so, on NIV, right? Yes, sir. He was on NIV. So, at this stage, patient was still on NIV. Uh, yes, sir, because ABG was repeated uh, uh, just after shifting patient, ABG was repeated, sir. No, all what I'm saying is whenever you give information on ABG, these are the things which has to be captured. Okay. Yes. NIV, oxygen, ventilator, what is the FiO2? <clears throat> Otherwise, interpreting, see, ABGs have to be interpreted in the context of the clinical condition, not in isolation. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. What seems to have changed in the ABG? We are already one and a half hours down the road. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, can Sir, we... there is a respiratory compensation like uh, with the support of NIV uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation the respiratory compensation is more so a pH is corrected but still uh, uh, bicarb are, bicarbs are uh, low so metabolic acidosis which got compensated go to the next slide mm, pre anesthetic ch checking was done and patient was uh, under, underwent uh, emergency uh, Exploratory laparotomy after taking high risk concerns, sir, in view of uh, intestinal obstruction with gangrenous bowel. What the findings were uh, gangrenous segment approximate uh, 10 centimeters and uh, 150 centimeters from uh, uh, DJ flexure resisted, and the uh, proximal bowel loop were dilated and the distal loops were collapsed, sir. And patchy discoloration of uh, proximal regional uh, loops were present and the uh, proximal loop uh, brought up as stomas. Mm -hmm. uh, post operatively, patient uh, continued an uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. So, so, what was the surgical impression? What was, no, no, what, was the, what was the surgical impression? What this is ischemic or you said uh, gangrenous? Was the gangrenous due to a band or was it due to volvulus or what was it due to? Uh, so, so ischemia the, can happen due to due, how was you said it's discolored. The proximal jejunum was discolored. There was this. So, this, uh, which vessel was? Uh, did they look at the vessels uh, which were uh, this thing? Was there a thrombus or what was it due to? Uh, sir, intraop there was no any uh, 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 like thrombus or any. They couldn't find anything intraoperatively. Uh, so they just resected the uh, this bowel, sir. Uh, so there was no evidence of any thrombus or any other bleed uh, or any other uh, like adhesions or constrictions. It was not there. Sir. No, because you know this is a pretty dangerous area because uh, at the dj flexor you know this is uh, where uh, you know it's uh, the duodenum is attached to the posterior uh, uh, this thing uh, it's in the uh, uh, it's retroperitor and uh, at the flexure where exactly at the fracture? Is, was it in the jejunum or was it or was it part of the duodenum also involved? You say DJ flexure, 150 centimeters from the DJ flexure. So, so uh, that's jejunum, about one and a half. Yeah. So it was the part of jejunum. It was a part of jejunum. Okay. Yes. Sir. All right. Okay. Go on. 
Mm. Post operatively, they, patient they, they put a stoma. One minute. One minute. What? What did they do? They proximal loop brought up as a stoma. Yes, sir. So well, you had what? You had the double lumen stoma out. Or what? what no, sir. Single lumen stoma was there, and distal loop they stapled, sir. Only single lumen stoma was there, sir, and one drain was placed. So the stoma was draining. Uh, sir, uh, 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 there is uh, the, they they have created the stoma, sir, but drain was not much, sir. Uh, after like uh, day two and day three, uh, drain drain were around fifty to hundred ml. Uh, uh, it was there. Sir. What was the thought process of putting the stoma? Uh, sir, uh, because the uh, uh, bowel was uh, gangrenous, sir, and some patchy discolouration was there, so there is a high risk that it can uh, uh, ascend up. Uh, so further uh, re-exploration can be needed. So uh, and since the healing was also healing will also be uh, delayed because of the gangrenous uh, uh, involvement. So and you had no output from the stoma, uh, sir. Uh, it uh, after that it started uh, like hundred to one fifty. Uh, no, no. One thing is any stoma. Which is uh, near the duodenum, because the amount of secretions that come out is so much. Generally, mm -hmm. any stoma produces a large amount of output, right? Yes. I mean, this is as I understand anything that is closer to the jejunum. Of course, is one fifty centimeters away, but uh, any fistula which develops at that level tends to be a high output fistula. Right? Yes. So you had no drain from the stoma at all? Uh, sir, Second really secretions were there, sir. Uh, uh, but not much, like around 100, 200 ml, uh, it was there, sir. Okay. All right. And where was the stoma put? It was in the lateral position, central, or? A lateral, sir, yeah. left lateral position it was this. All right. Go on, go on. Mm. Postoperatively, uh, patient continued on invasive mechanical ventilation and with items of BP 100 by 60 mmHg and you know, NORIT support. Um, coming to his heart rate at uh, 92 per minute and uh, SPO2 of 97% on uh, FAO2 of 40%, sir. And it's a respiratory rate is 22 per minute. Mm. What was the mode you had put him on? A PRVC mode. Don't mention what. Uh, PRVC mode. Sir. PRVC. Why do you prefer PRVC? Uh, sir, it will uh, uh, it it will uh, deliver the desired volume, sir, and high pressures will be uh, avoided, sir. Uh, high inspiratory pressures uh, uh, it, it will av avoid, sir. So plateau pressures and uh, peak pressures it will we can set the limits. Sir. How does that do it? Couldn't hear, sir. Uh, not audible, sir. How does that do it? What type of what? What mode of ventilation is the PRVC? What mode of ventilation is it? Is it volume control? Is it pressure control? Volume control. I, I see this quite often. People. Say put PRVC. Why? Because we don't get high because pressure regulation. At what cost does this volume control? Volume control. Is PRVC volume control? Volume control. So what what is that? How do how, how do you achieve the volume? Uh, we read about, uh, about uh the prc prvc how it functions how does how does it not allow the pressure to go up uh, sir, in pressure a particular volume to be delivered oh, 
The TRVC is basically pressure control mode. Okay, that's why pressure doesn't shoot. And you that's try, it. you try to so, the flow and try to achieve volume. That's it. It's not a pressure control. It's not a volume control. As I rightly put it, if it is volume control, pressure not a volume generated. Control. Please remember pressure. that. Okay. You know how okay. can we now to assure a particular volume? And you know, if you keep a patient on a volume control mode, it's inversely proportional. The pressure goes up. Now, if the patient's lung is getting stiff, if you want to want to maintain a pressure at a particular level, what is my to achieve that tidal volume? Are you aware of how what the dynamics of PRVC is? You know. Intensivists generally don't use PRVC because that's used by people who don't understand mechanical ventilation because they say, if it's a straightforward case like your patient, if you've got an acute lung injury, you, I see quite a lot of people put PRVC. Okay. You've got to understand the dynamics. If the lungs get stiffer and you are delivering a tidal volume and you're saying the pressure is going to be constant. Something has to compromise, no? Suppose in volume control, if you keep, if you keep at a particular volume and, and the compliance starts to fall down, what happens to the pressure, the plateau pressure, pressure starts to go up, yes. right? So if you're saying the patient has got a lung injury and has got a stiff lung and you're saying your pressure is constant and the tidal volume is delivered, something has to be compromised, right? If you understand the logistics, so what I'm trying to tell you is that please understand your mechanical ventilation concepts uh, before trying to think that it is a very slung issues. Okay, move on because I think we need to. We are already one hour forty minutes. Again, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. You, you have written pulse pressure variation from arterial line uh, waveform showed 8% variability. Yes, okay. uh, Please tell me what are the limitations of using pulse pressure variation in your patient, in this patient? Uh, open. Sir, he had and abdominal right. distension, uh, uh, like uh, open abdomen. So we should avoid open abdomen. Like stoma was later, sir, post abdominal surgery. Sto stoma being pulled out is different from you're talking about decompressive laparostomy. Please don't confuse here. It's not decompressive laparostomy, it's just a stoma being pulled out. Okay, intra abdominal pressures are still high, isn't it? If you really actually measure. Okay, now. What is the, uh, you know, how useful is using pulse pressure variation in a patient with raised intra-abdominal pressure? And even if you still want to use it, what correction you have to add? Sir, it will be unreliable, sir. With the raised abdominal pressure, uh, the uh, changes will be unreliable. Yeah, pulse pressure variation, you know, you can't use in patient with raised intra-abdominal pressure, isn't it? Yes, sir. Why? Because you can't use the same cutoff that you use. You're assuming abdominal wall compliance to be normal and lung compliance to be normal. Yes. Okay. So if, if abdominal wall, if abdominal compliance is uh, low, okay, especially if the pressures are high, so what will happen to the variation? Variations will be more. Mm -hmm. So you can't use a normal cutoff. So if, if if even if you wish to use, your cutoff should be different. Okay, but you need to understand here is that by and large, you can't extrapolate the utility of pulse pressure variation like how you use it in normal patients to a patient with raised intra-abdominal pressure. Okay, now what are the other limitations of uh, pulse pressure variation in, in normal patients? Uh, sir, it cannot be used in spontaneous breathing patient. There should not be any tachycardias or, or arrhythmias. Uh, then the lung compliance should be good and it, ca it can't be uh, reliable in low, low, low tidal volume uh, ventilation. Sir. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Tell me what's the difference between systolic pressure variation, pulse pressure variation, and stroke volume variation. Uh, sir, pulse pressure variation will be uh, 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 the the cutoff value is thirteen uh, percent, sir. For stroke volume, it is ten percent, sir. Uh, and systolic blood pressure variation, we will be seeing a uh, uh, delta up uh, trend and delta down trend, sir. So when the delta delta uh, delta down that uh, various uh, delta down delta down the the values will be more than we will say that it is a uh, uh, fluid response. In systolic pressure variation, how what do you measure? In dias in uh, pulse pressure variation, what do you measure? What are the variables? And in stroke volume variation, what are you measuring? So in systolic blood pressure, uh, the uh, we will measure systolic blood pressure. One value will be uh, uh, one value. The primary value will be uh, uh, considered, and then and then uh, with respect to that, uh, any uh, the delta upward change or downward change will measure, sir. Uh, and in stroke, up in we need cardiac out. Delta up in is in inspiration, expiration. Where where do you take the middle level in systolic pressure variation? Where do you take the mid level? You said delta up and delta down. Uh, yes. What is the baseline? How do you get the baseline in the uh, systolic pressure variation? End, uh, end uh, I'm not sure. Which part of apnea you take the baseline? End expiratory and the delta up, uh, delta up will be in the delta uh, up of what that baseline uh, systolic blood pressure. Uh, from that, the difference, uh, the like, right blood systolic, blood blood systolic blood pressure. pressure. Yes, sir. So, you take from delta up and delta down, and that's what you add and uh, divide by me, uh, 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 divide by the uh, thing. Divided by mean. Uh, divided by. Come on, you guys, you got to do some reading. What's the difference between stroke, stroke volume? Where, what do you measure in the stroke, stroke volume variation, and in pulse pressure variation? And of the three, which is the most accurate? No, sir. Stroke volume variation will be most accurate, sir. Because it uh, directly led to the RC curve between pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, and systolic pressure variation, which is the highest in terms. Have you looked at Mishad's study on that? No, there is a, uh, Jean Louis Taboul's comparison between the three. I would suggest you read it. Okay. Yes. Right. Move on. And day two, uh, patient developed uh, atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate and patient treated with injection amiodarone uh, 150 mg bolus followed by infusion uh, 1 mg per minute for 6 hours sir, and followed by 0.5 mg per minute for 18 hours. And uh, atrial fibrillation re uh, reverted back to sinus uh, rhythm sir. And 2 day echo at the time, uh, EF is 60% uh, sir with no regional wall motion abnormality and uh, AF during studies and ectopics were noted. And patient continued on mechanical ventilation and the anticoagulation initiated in, in view of uh, uh, aerial fibrillation post surgical status. And shock was persisting and uh, we continued nodded uh, infusions. What is the implication of AF in this patient? Uh, so, so post -op post -op very important question. Very important question. What is the importance of AF? It, uh, it can be sir, a septic uh, myocard. Uh, it can be related to any electrolyte dis uh, disturbances or any uh, post surgical or any uh, septic myocarditis associated. It can be there. Sir. Could this be the precipitating factor which has caused his ischemia, an embolic episode? Is he a chronic AF person? Uh, no, sir. No, no any sir. past history, no uh, past cardiac, history. Uh, no any significant cardiac past history. First time. Uh, tell you a past history. If he's had short runs of AF, do you think he is crot prone? Would you think that? whatever ischemic episode that he's had, and if you think he doesn't have atherosclerotic disease, could he have had 
uh, embolic episode because of a pre-existing AF. Possibility. So he will need further workup in this yes, direction. Yes, we have done CCT uh, to rule out any uh, thrombus. I think you need CCT or you would need uh, long-term follow-up of uh, uh, long-term follow-up in terms of ultra monitoring uh, to decide whether he needs long-term anticoagulation. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, but, uh, it's a possibility, no? Yes, you, you, you don't have any cause. There was no surgical cause for the gangrene. Could this have been an embolic episode? Yeah. It, it would have gone into the superior mesenteric, right? A branch of the superior mesentery, mm -hmm. if it was in the distal uh, jejunum, if it was higher up, it would have been the gastroid. What okay. is Chadwick's uh, For starting uh, anticoagulations in uh, non valvular, we. The. He... For um, Chadbox, uh, for starting anticoagulation, sir, we have to uh, see the score, sir. Uh, if it is greater than two, uh, we will start the anticoagulation in AF patients. Okay, the other thing, see, one more thing is uh, AF happened on day two, day two, isn't it? Day two, yes, sir. And when you're starting anticoagulation, yours, that means it's therapeutic anticoagulation. Okay. okay. So, you, you know, your decision to start therapeutic anticoagulation on day two after major intraoblum surgery is a difficult decision. Okay. That's something which has to cross your mind. Okay. So, you are here to see what are the things that should cross your mind before you take clinical decisions at the bedside. Okay. And uh, atrial fibrillation in a non-cardiac patient, especially in this systemic uh, you know, a, co a complicated case is an independent risk factor. Always remember, an AF coming in a non-cardiac setting, especially in this situation, is an, is an independent risk factor. Try to, you know, that's one thing you should cross your mind. Okay. Yeah. Next one. Could have happened because of the sepsis itself, or it could have been a, this whole stress episode may have triggered a pre-existing AF. So if you want to start therapeutic Therapeutic dose in a 24 hours after, uh, because I, you know, using a prophylactic dose is not what is appropriate if you are trying to prevent further embolism. So I would think that if you need to do a therapeutic intervention, because sometimes transthoracic, you are not able to demonstrate the clot, you may have to even consider doing a transesophageal because what is there in, in the uh, oracles sometimes in the appendages you may not be able to see the clot uh, transthoracically so if you're going to use therapeutic dose i would think that you should consider doing a transesophageal before implementing uh, before so, implementing uh, uh, so we started prophylactic dose sir uh, actually so your prophylactic dose is not for from the af point your, your answer was very clear you said because of the af you started anticoagulation. Uh, sir, which a patient you don't start, also uh, and post surgery. So, in care, uh, to, uh, like for DVT prophylaxis in point. But to defer that too, because if you are giving anticoagulation from the AF point of view, you are using it to prevent further embolism. Uh, sir, for, basically it was for DVT. Uh, 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 sir, uh, it was for DVT prophylaxis and additional risk factor of AF was there. Sir. So, we started early. You can't combine the two. You can't say you're giving anticoagulation from AF. Uh, as a prophylactic dose. Anticoagulation from AF has to be full therapeutic dose. So if you are trying to club the two, you are not doing appropriate justice for the other. One, you may do well for uh, uh, prophylactic dose, may well for DVT prophylaxis. That's fair enough. That's justified at that dose. Yes. But if you are saying you are starting it because of AF, that's a different ball game. It, it doesn't fit in. Yes. Okay, right. That, so, that is why you use lead risk. Okay. Risk to, of whenever you start therapeutic anticoagulation to assess the risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are some of the things which you should know. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think time. we should quickly wind up because yeah. we are nearly two hours into the program.
on day three, uh, the ECT abdomen was uh, done, uh, which shows uh, digital thickening and no obvious shown of for transition, sir. And the urine cultures and blood cultures and aspirated fluid uh, reports were sterile, sterile and the IVF uh, uh, intraven intravenous fluid reduced to 50 ml per hour and we have started on TPN, sir, 50 ml per hour. And what uh, is the indication for TPN here? Yeah? Uh, Sir, patient or day, day, on day, day, day three, day, uh, he was prior to admission also, he was a uh, deal by mouth. So he was day four, not uh, they, there was no in the inter, internal flu, uh, feeding, sir. And since the there is chance, uh, like a uh, patient was uh, still hem hem hemodynamic instable and there was uh, like a surgical, uh, there is a risk of surgery, uh, uh, re-exploration surgery. So uh, we thought that uh, we couldn't start inter internal feeding uh, in the uh, in the mo more one or two days. So that's why we started a TPN here. So. I think you're mixing two things here. Uh, you're not got his question right. He's asking why you started TPN on day three. He's not questioning your decision to keep the patient nil by mouth. What fact? Why do you start TPN in this patient on day three? That is a specific question. Sir, we would have start earlier, like day two. We are, like in the span guideline. It's uh, if we are we are unable to start start in day day three or day four, then we should uh, start immediately. It's, to but... assess him nutritionally, what was his nutritional status and what score system would you use to assess him uh, preoperatively? I mean, in the perioperative field, <laughs> what are the scoring system that you know, which which will tell you that he's at a high risk? of malnutrition he's on day three if he was and for one day before that what was the was he man was he malnourished did he have weight loss was he having chronic malnutrition? this is an acute onset mm -hmm. if you are obviously following the european guidelines who are a little bit more aggressive as opposed to the american uh, aspen guidelines versus the ispen guideline so to complete ball set i mean did you do an assessment, nutritional assessment for it? And if we are doing assessment, what nutritional assessment scores would you use? See, nutrition and abdominal sepsis, abdominal uh, illness go hand in hand. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Have you heard of the subjective global assessment? Uh, yes, sir. Have you heard of NRS score? Uh, yes, sir. What other scores are there? There are three or four scores, Nutrix score. So, yes. was there any history of weight loss before this? Yes. So, what I'm trying to say is that here you have a stoma. Your stoma output may be less because you started TPN. Yes. One of the reasons to decrease GI secretion is to start TPN and octreotide. Yes. So did you give octreotide? Uh, no, sir. The yeah. reason why the why this stoma see any stoma near the jejunum is a high output stoma. So I don't know. You said there was hardly anything coming out from there. What do you say? Uh, Maybe you, have, you have no answer why you started TPN. Uh, sir, uh, sir, assessment uh, assessment scores we couldn't remember, sir. But uh, after that uh, day, uh, uh, like uh, since uh, uh, with acute illness, uh, uh, that's why we started, sir. TPN. Okay, you said it started at fifty ml per. How much protein? How much calories? And how much? Uh, uh, what was the distribution of the proteins, calories that you were giving him? Uh, sir, daily a thousand uh, thousand uh, kika, uh, thousand calorie thousand kcalor per day. Uh, it was there, sir. So we started with that. And how much protein was there? Uh, protein, sir. Uh, uh, when uh, we started with sir, uh, 60, uh, 60 uh, grams, sir. Sixty gram. If you're giving one liter, as I assume you were giving. Yes. Sir. Per uh, 24 hours, uh, 200. 1, 000, 1, 200. It comes as a th you use the three in one bag, right? Yes, sir. You use the three in one bag. You get three in one bags, or you you have you compounded the TPN? No, sir. Three in one three bag. In one bag. Uh, 
Because three in one bag comes either in a liter or one and a half liters. So did you use one liter or did you use one and a half liters? A one liter bag. If you're using 50 ml per hour, that that comes to 1,200 in 24 hours. One liter bag was used sir, for uh, uh, initial. So one liter bag has 40 grams protein. Uh, yes. So what was the additional protein you gave 20 grams? Where you gave it from? No, sir. It, it must be 40, sir. Uh, so? Yes. Uh, 40 grams of protein. You're walking into a trap. If I'm your examiner, you have, you have already walked into a trap. Uh, right? So sometimes when you use all these solutions, please note what you're using. Now, you know, TPN means nothing. Did you give full TPN or just you gave proteins, calories? Did you give, uh, what was the vitamin uh, you need to give? What is the recommended daily allowance of vitamins that you give? What is the recommended daily? What is the, how do you mix your vitamin with this thing? And he was a sure. He was a diabetic. How was your sugars with the TPN? Sugars were controlled, sir. Uh, intermittent, he required uh, insulin. Uh, so how did you do replace the micronutrients? You are only giving macronutrient. All in one bag has only macronutrient. Uh, what are the micronutrients you need to give? And how do you give it? Uh, sir, zinc, uh, uh, sir. Suppose this fellow has a leak. Suppose tomorrow he has a leak. You, you've got you, a high chance of leak because of the jejunal area can develop a leak. So if he develops a leak, what are the additional precautions you will do? Sir, electrolyte uh, supplement like uh, calcium, magnesium, phosphate. So we should monitor and we should uh, supplement those, sir, apart from uh, uh, like potassium and other electrolytes. In a high output fistula, what are the things you would you add octreotide to this patient or no? Uh, yes, sir. No. It will decrease the blood. Okay, I think, uh, I think we've we've nearly finished our time now. Uh, let's wind up quickly, please. If there are any questions, anything else left? Uh, this? Sir, no, sir. no, so only serial uh, serial lab values and day -to -day uh, so. You weaned him off on day three. Uh, you know, right, sir, uh, weaned off on day three, no, sir. No. And uh, when did you wean him extubation? On day four. Day four, day yes. Four. Sir. Yeah, okay. And then the uh, patient shifted out from ICU on day five, sir, and discharged at day seven, at day, day eight, eight, sir. Okay. And we de-escalated right. the antibiotics at day five, sir. That's what, did you need to give that high antibiotic? Mm -hmm. Because you had source control. You could have done well, even with the, though, you know, these third generation cephalosporin should have covered it also. So the take home message is, and you can continue with the cardron or the amiodarone as it should have been said. Um, sir, after that, uh, uh... Uh, that uh, rate was the uh, uh, sinus rhythm was reverted back and there was no history prior and uh, uh, the, we are continuous monitored. So we didn't uh, continued uh, with the tablet card. Okay. So we, can we answer the questions now? I think that's if there sir. is, we should wind up in the next five, 10 minutes. Yes, sir. I think most of the questions were being answered, sir. Uh, one more question. It's uh, the role of heart therapy, hydrocortisone. Ah. That, that is mean, all uh, Maric's uh, gimmick. He, he does a lot of gimmick giving vitamin C, thiamine. I thought you all also gave thiamine, no? 200 uh, OD started. Hey, he was not an alcoholic. Why you gave thiamine? You want you didn't give vitamin C, but you gave thiamine. Did you follow the hat trial? The larger trial showed that it was a big gimmick. It really doesn't work. Uh, yes, sir. There is no role of vitamin C or uh, uh, thiamine. It's Paul Merrick's gimmick. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Yes, Is that sir. It? Can we call it a day? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Pravinamin, sir, and Damon, sir for your uh, valuable and insightful and extensive and exhaustive. I think this is the uh, more prolonged, I think, compared to all master classes, is more extensive. 
So thank you for your uh, sharing uh, valuable clinical knowledge. I think most of the students got benefited. Almost 180 students, uh, they were uh, logged into the, this uh, master class. So I thank uh, Satish, Dr. Satish and uh, Dr. Chinmay for uh, bringing out this case uh, where the discussion uh, happened elaborately and helped all other uh, students. And I thank Ashwada Hospitals, ISCCM uh, for giving this opportunity on this platform of master class. I think we'll be, we'll be bringing uh, more and more such sessions and Dr. Venkatraman Kola, sir, who's the brainchild uh, behind this uh, and helping a uh, lot of uh, students. Any, any final thoughts from you, sir? It's a pleasure to have you both of you on this platform, sir. Thank you. So the only thing of what I want to tell is again, a couple of things. One, please don't use phrases like you can, you can. Please tell in the exam, be, tell what you wish to tell because that irritates the examiners sometimes. Okay, that's number one. Number two, as Dr. Praveen Amin said, don't use trade names, use chemical names. Okay, uh, so these are two things which you, you know, you have to remember. Using trade names, you know, we can land you up in trouble. Okay. Yes. Otherwise, you know, some more confidence and uh, I'm sure, you know, you are in second year or final year? First year, sir. IDC, IDC same, sir. Okay. Anyway, uh, you know, all the best. All the best for your future. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the uh, session. Yeah. We'll call it a day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, the delegates. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir.